Welcome to Brain in Advance. We are thoroughly thrilled to be rejoined by one of our favorite guests, Jeff McMahon. In our previous episode, we talked about Derek Parfit, and today we're going to be talking about something that's been on everyone's minds for a long time, which is the ethics of war. Jeff, would you like to start with a real-life case? Yes. Let me give you a very recent real-life case. There was a Russian soldier who was with some other Russian military personnel they were separated, I believe, from their unit. They had, I believe, stolen a car and were trying to make their way back to their Russian unit. They were armed in this car. And as they were going along, they saw a, a pedestrian, a man in his early 60s, walking along, speaking on a mobile phone. And one of the people in the car said, this man may be reporting us and they may come to, to get us before we can get back to our, to our people, shoot him because he may be reporting our location. And if he does, we've had it. And so this 21 year old Russian soldier in the car had his gun with him and he shot this civilian, I believe in the head more than once. But they were captured, at least this particular soldier was captured, and he was the, he is, I believe, the very first Russian soldier put on trial for war crimes. And the particular war crime was shooting and killing this unarmed civilian in the streets. And he, when apprehended, apologized or tried to convey his remorse to the widow of this man and said he would accept whatever penalty the courts imposed on him. It, it seemed to me that he felt guilt and remorse. You, one repeatedly saw pictures of him in the newspapers here. And in all those pictures, he's never looking at the camera. He's always hanging his head and looking at the floor. And he looks like a bewildered kid, basically. And the, the trial was concluded the other day and he was sentenced to life in prison in the Ukraine work. I think Ukraine does not have the death penalty. So this is the most severe sentence that he could uh, get. So the traditional view on war is that if you are a soldier fighting in a war, you get a kind of free pass on a lot of actions that you could perform, even if you're fighting on the wrong side of a war. So even if the cause that you're fighting for is unjust, just the mere fact that you're at war allows you to perform actions like the soldier did. Do you think that the court should have found him guilty, assuming that had another civilian done what he'd done, it would have been a horrendous action. It would have been murderous action. Should he be given any leniency because he's a soldier? I know the kind of view that you're referring to actually, the, all traditions of thinking about the ethics of war and also the law of war coincide in condemning this man's killing of a harmless civilian. And so both morally and legally, I think everyone agrees that what he did was wrong. Quite possibly there are some people who will hold the view that you hold that sort of in war, everything is permitted because of conditions of complete chaos and so on and so forth. That's not a serious contender among any, uh, contemporary philosophers, really. What I wanted to say in response to this particular case is that I think that this young Russian soldier should have received a, a, a lesser penalty. That's my judgment from afar. I don't know the details, but from what I read, my sense is that this was a frightened, bewildered young kid from Russia who's there under duress, a number of these soldiers, you know, if they go to this, to, to Ukraine and find that what they've been told by their government is actually false, namely there is no genocide among the Russian speakers in Ukraine, 
Ukraine was in no way poised to attack or threaten Russia in any way. Still, they are very fearful of to serve, defecting, surrendering to the other side or whatever. They're under extreme duress. They are, they feel frightened and imperiled. These soldiers were isolated, trying to get back to their unit. He was scared. And I think all of these conditions of his situation, including his young age and the fact that somebody told him, shoot that man. I don't think it was a superior officer who told him this, but he was sort of told do it. And he seemed clearly to experience remorse. I think that this young Russian soldier, although a murderer, is also a victim of this war and ought to be treated with some leniency. That is, they're excusing conditions that apply to his action. And I think it would have been the decent, humane thing for the Ukrainian court to show itself superior to the Russians by exercising a certain degree of leniency with this young man who acted on the spur of the moment and has now his whole life is gone. But he's a victim of Putin along with the Ukrainians. I want to see if we can make some adjustments to the case and if we can reach a point where we would say it's not only that you've changed the sentence but that you would say the person should be exonerated in entirety so let's say what you have is someone who is uh not quite a civilian so we know for example in ukraine that all men between the ages of 18 and 65 have been conscripted into the war in other words they are all people who could pose uh, a threat a lethal threat to the Russian soldiers. Uh, and so let's assume that the person sitting in that car views himself as a, as a member of the Ukrainian resistance, that he sees his role as fighting off the Russian soldiers. And maybe he doesn't have a weapon on him, but let's assume that that cell phone call was to go and tell other people where these soldiers were and to tell them, these soldiers are in this place, there's only two of them, you can kill them if you take the following steps. And let's assume then, in other words, what's believed by the Russian soldiers is actually true. And that the only way that they could repel this would be through, let's say it's a distance away, they can see the person making the call. Let's say that they know what's being said on the call and that the only way to stop it would be, you know, through a distance bullet. And maybe let's say they're even aiming for the hand so they can shoot the bullet out, you know, shoot the phone out of his hand. But, you know, they hit him in the head, it's inches away. Under those conditions, do we say no penalty? Even though you're engaged in an unjust war, even though what Putin is doing is wrong, you're entitled to have killed this person, given the facts. Interesting case. I think, again, though, that if this man, he was 62 years old, I believe, he had not been conscripted into the army. He was not wearing a uniform. He was uh, very clearly a civilian. He was talking on a mobile phone, walking down the street, in no way actively threatening these soldiers. And so I think that even if he had been reporting their location to the Ukraine, Ukrainian soldiers, that still, that would not under law have changed his status to that of combatant. He was not carrying a weapon. He himself posed no threat. He was alerting people, but civilians are permitted to do that. They, you know, they can phone and say, I see Russians over here and, and alert their own troops to the presence of enemy forces. They're permitted to do that. Now that's the law. In my view, these Russian soldiers were unjust, wrongful invaders of Ukraine. They were like, take a, 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 a small scale analogy. Imagine that these are people, intruders in a, a house who, who have tied up some of the occupants of the house and maybe shot one of the people in the house. Another person in the house who's tied up gets the opportunity to make a phone call to the police to alert people, you know, these intruders are in my house posing a threat to me. That doesn't do anything to make that person on the telephone morally liable to be attacked by the invaders. And I think exactly the same thing is true in the case of the Russian soldiers. 
they are where they ought not to be. They're in somebody else's country. They are threatening the freedom, threatening the lives of people in this country. They have absolutely no right of self-defense whatsoever. They don't have a right to shoot. In my view, they, it's not permissible for them to shoot a Ukrainian soldier who's about to shoot them. If they shoot a Ukrainian soldier who's about to shoot them, that's murder because the Ukrainian soldier has done nothing to make him or herself morally liable to be attacked by these people who are there where they ought not to be posing threats that they ought not to pose to people. And so that applies even more clearly and obviously to the civilian, even if he were reporting their location to the Ukrainian military. He's doing something he has a perfect right to do. The soldiers ought not to be there at all. The only thing they can permissibly do is throw down their weapons, surrender, or defect and join the Ukrainian military or get out of Ukraine somehow or other. They can't use force permissibly in self-defense or in defense of other Russians. So you've raised the case that I wanted yeah. to bring up next, which is imagine the 62 year old was not a civilian. Suppose he is wearing a Ukrainian uniform and has a gun. You're saying that the Russian soldier still is not permitted to shoot specifically because he's fighting an unjust war. Now that isn't the traditional view. So the traditional view is that because he's a soldier fighting against another combatant, he is imbued with certain rights or he has the capacity to perform certain actions that normally would not be permissible. So it seems like baked into the traditional view is this idea that the moral status of enemy combatants is the same across both sides of the line, regardless of the justice of the war involved. Why do you think that doesn't hold that moral equivalence? You've stated the sort of core notion of traditional just war theory that a number of contemporary moral philosophers have disputed. Walzer calls it the moral quality of soldiers. He's the first person, to, as far as I know, in moral philosophy to give it a name. The name evolved into the moral equality of combatants to make it clear that these aren't just soldiers who are, you know, wearing a uniform somewhere in the world, but there are people who are actually engaged in combat. And the traditional doctrine is that states are morally responsible for whether wars that are fought are just or unjust, that they are responsible for the moral character of the war. So if a soldier is fighting in an unjust war, the blame for that goes and the responsibility for that is belongs to the state, not to the soldier. Soldiers can't be expected to uh, be able to make these judgments about whether their wars or the particular aims in the war are just or unjust. So I'm inclined to think that it, it's less helpful for moral precision to think of a, a combatant's liability or to attack or immunity to attack, to be derived from whether the war as a whole is just or unjust. I think it, it, it derives from the, what the particular individual is doing. And that means what aims the, that individual is pursuing now and will pursue in the future. And it's possible for people who are fighting in a just war to pursue unjust aims in the just war. And occasionally it's possible for people who are fighting in a war that is overall unjust to be pursuing an aim that within that war is just. And so my view is that the soldier's liability can, or immunity can shift depending on what the particular the soldier is pursuing are at a given time or over the course of the war. But I have argued against the moral equality of combatants. I think it gets the, the intuitive force that it has from two facts. One is that it coincides with what the law says. And the law says that soldiers who are fighting in an illegal war are not for that reason alone acting illegally. And that seems to me a justifiable view because we don't want every soldier who fights in an unjust war to be liable to legal prosecution at the end of the war. And in particular, if there's dispute about which war, you know, which side was in the wrong or in the right, there's the danger of victor's justice in which the side that's actually fighting in the wrong wins. And then 
prosecutes the soldiers on the other side saying they were fighting in an unjust war. So there are all these uh, practical reasons why the law, at least at present, is probably right to incorporate the sort of legal equality of combatants. But it seems to me that it's a really a hopeless doctrine, morally speaking. One thing that can be said for it morally is what I, but mistakenly, I think, is what I said earlier about the Russian soldier in Ukraine who's just been sentenced to life imprisonment, and that is that often soldiers who fight in unjust wars or who fight for unjust aims in a war have excusing conditions that apply to them. They are ignorant. They have been indoctrinated. They have been brainwashed. They are under duress. They fear for their lives. All of these pressures applied to them and they act in ways that relatively decent people can act in these conditions, you know, that are deeply morally wrong, but nevertheless, people succumb to acting in these ways because of the pressures that are applied to them. And again, we probably don't want to impose severe punishments on these people in the aftermath of the war, given all the pressures that have been applied to them to get them to do what, it, in my view, is seriously morally wrong. Nevertheless, I think there's nothing to be said for the idea that somebody who, as in the case of the Russians today, invades another country without any good reason whatsoever. There's no justification for the Russian invasion of Ukraine. All the things that the Kremlin says are just obvious lies. And here these people are threatening the lives and liberties of people in Ukraine, threatening to bring them under the rule of this monster, Putin. It, it eliminating their their sense that they are different from the Russians and want to be different and live differently from the way the Russians do and not be told what to do by the Kremlin and so on. These people have no permission to go and kill people to impose these wrongful goals of theirs on the innocent people in Ukraine. So when it, yeah, again, go back to the uh, analogy with ordinary uh, life. The Russian soldiers are unjust attackers. They are threatening and harming wholly innocent people. Those innocent people have a right of defense against what the Russians are doing. And what the Ukrainian soldiers are doing is not so much self-defense, but defense of other innocent people. It's sort of third-party defense of other innocent people. When they put on uniforms and go out with guns, that's not self-defense. They're exposing themselves deliberately to harm by uh, Russian soldiers. They're doing that in order to protect other innocent Ukrainian citizens. They are there as defenders of other innocent people. They are acting with full justification. They're not doing anything that can make them morally liable to harm by Russian soldiers. So if a Russian soldier kills a Ukrainian soldier, no moral justification for that whatsoever. That is a, 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 an egregious moral wrong. So I wonder if we can get a sense of the lay of the land. What are the conditions that would make a war just? What are the conditions that would make the starting of a war unjust? And then are there separate things once you're in a war, whether it's just or unjust, that you ought not to be allowed to do regardless of the justice of your cause? Yes. The, there are these traditional principles of discrimination, proportionality, necessity. I think those are the core principles governing the conduct of war. So discrimination is uh, traditionally stated as the, uh, you know, as a principle of civilian immunity. It's the idea is that one must never attack, intentionally attack civilians. I interpret the principle in a more generic way. The principle of discrimination is attack only those people who are morally liable to attack those people who will not be wronged by being attacked. Doesn't mean that they deserve to be attacked, um, but they're not wronged not because they deserve to be attacked, but because they are liable to attack, to be attacked. They have acted in a way that makes it just to attack them rather than allow them to go on to do what they would otherwise do. 
So that's what I take, uh, that's how I understand the principle of discrimination. There's the principle of proportionality, which says the use of force should not be excessive in relation to the goals to be achieved and the requirement of necessity says something like this, that one, one's action should be effective and that there should be no less harmful means of achieving one's goals. That's a simplification, but all these principles are actually considerably more complicated than I've been able to uh, indicate in these brief remarks. But again, the, the law of war has to have principles that people on both sides can obey. And moral theorists have also thought we need principles governing the conduct of war that combatants on both sides can equally well satisfy, can equally obey. They hold for, for both. And I think this is really another important motivation for Walzer's defense of the moral equality of combatants. But I think if we try to understand the principle of discrimination and the principle of proportionality and the principle of necessity in ways that make them morally coherent, people who fight for unjust aims can't satisfy them, period. And so, Again, it seems to me that the morality of war is radically asymmetrical between those who are fighting for just aims and those who are fighting for unjust aims. So take the principle of discrimination. It says, attack only those people who are liable to attack. Well, take the case of Ukraine now. Which people in Ukraine are morally liable to be attacked by Russian soldiers? What I've suggested is, there are, take the principle of proportionality. It says the good that's to be achieved, the you know, the, that w which consists in the achievement of the just goals. That's the good that's taken into account in the proportionality calculation is to be weighed against the harm and the harm being harm to innocent people. The justification is not a kind of liability justification. So again, the Russians want to undertake some kind of mission, they're going to attack some military target, it's going to kill some civilians as a side effect. We can ask the question, will the killing of those civilians be proportionate? Well, there's the harm to the civilians. What's the good that's going to be achieved that can be weighed against that harm? There is no good. In, in the law of war, it says, that the harm to the civilians has to be proportionate in relation to the military advantage to be achieved by the action. But in the case of the Russian soldiers, now the military advantage that they might achieve is not good. It's bad. It's very bad if the Russians achieve a military advantage because it makes it more likely that they're going to be able to achieve their unjust aims. Therefore, no Russian soldier can use violence in Ukraine right now in a way that is discriminate. No Russian soldier can use violence right now in Ukraine in a way that is proportionate. I haven't given you the argument, but the same thing would apply to the necessity requirement as well. I'm curious about the original case, specifically with regard to how we divvy up responsibility between the individual soldier and the group, the collective on behalf of which he's fighting. And, and, and that might be what's behind the intuition of the moral equivalence of combatants, because perhaps someone says, okay, the soldier did something abominable qua soldier, but not qua individual. So qua individual, he wasn't acting. And so he shouldn't be punished as an individual, but qua soldier, he should be punished. Yeah. I just don't think we can separate person from soldier in this way. We wouldn't want to separate person from gang member, for example, or person from member of the mafia or, you know, some crime syndicate. I think what all we can do is to think that, as I've said before, the situation of a soldier is special. The soldier has been trained to use force and violence when ordered to do so by superiors. 
They've been conditioned to do this. They go through drills. Military training these days is very explicitly directed to breaking down the natural inhibitions that human beings have against killing other human beings. That tends to be part of military training in most modern armies now. They feel a sense of duty to their own country. They feel that they're doing their job as soldiers. When they've been sent somewhere, they naturally feel loyalty to their own country. They find it hard to believe that their own country could be engaged in serious wrongdoing. Everybody tends to think that their country is highly moral and, and so on and so forth. There's the force of superior orders. And as I said before, there are all these conditions of duress in Russia right now. I'm sure so many of these soldiers feel that if they were, to, for example, to defect or disobey orders, their families would be threatened. They themselves would be threatened with terrible punishments, possibly shot on the spot. I really don't know. And so there are all these excusing conditions. And I think that's the way to analyze what you were trying to express, Jason, in the, the, the distinction between the soldier and the person. So I wonder about the limits of what the Ukrainians are allowed to do to the Russians. So if it's the case that Russia is engaged in an unjust war, and none of those soldiers have any right to kill any Ukrainians, and if they do so, they're committing basically murder with no excuse, unless you've been brainwashed, as you say. So into this interesting territory about whether you could hold any of those soldiers morally responsible for actions that they take. So if they say, well, we do believe we're involved in a just war, given what we were told, and you know, when we go around uh, killing Ukrainians, it's what we believe to be in service of a just cause, even if it turns out that they're wrong. It seems like we say, well, you're not morally liable because you hold a false belief. And maybe there's a question about how reasonable it was to hold the false belief, but it would excuse your all your actions, similarly to how the traditional theory would work. But I wonder about this. Are the Ukrainians allowed to say, well, one way to stop these invaders is to act disproportionately. So for every Ukrainian you kill, we're going to kill 10 of your soldiers. And we're not going to kill you with bullets. We're going to kill you in the most painful way possible because we know it'll be a really good deterrent. So we're going to napalm you. And we also reckon one way to stop this war would be if we start shelling Moscow. And, you know, let's try and kill some civilians. Let's kill some Russian babies. That'll maybe sort of shock Putin into a sense of going, the costs of this war are too great. I'll withdraw my troops and assume that it would work, that if you killed enough Russian babies, the Russian soldiers would retreat. Are these all things that the Ukrainians would be morally entitled to do? No, I, I don't think so. The acts you were describing at the end are acts that we would appropriately describe as terrorism. Now, let me go back. You said for every Ukrainian soldier that's killed, the Ukrainians are going to kill 10 Russian soldiers. That you know, they're killing 10 Russian soldiers is going to be justified probably as a means of defense, independently of how many Ukrainians are killed. That is, it's permissible for the Ukrainians to kill Russian soldiers in most cases as a means of defense. That is to prevent their own country from being defeated and conquered and uh, occupied and annexed by Russia. I think there are exceptions to that. It's hard for Ukrainian soldiers to know what the exceptions are, but imagine that there's, but I want to get back to the terrorism too, so don't let me forget about that. But um, imagine that there is some Russian soldier in Ukraine who's there because he, he, he joined the army thinking that he was, this was, you know, he was going to be fulfilling a duty to his homeland and so on. And then he's told all this stuff about genocide by Nazis in Ukraine and the dire threat to existential threat to Russia from the Ukraine, all this ludicrous nonsense that Putin and others have were telling the soldiers. But suppose he believes this, goes into Ukraine, finds that conditions are totally different from what he was told they were going to be, doesn't find uh, grateful people rushing towards his tank saying, thank you for saving us from genocide. There's no evidence of that at all. No evidence of any threat to Russia militarily and so on. These are just people fleeing, refugees going out, and all they're doing is destroying buildings and cities and so on like that. And the soldier realized he's been lied to. There he is. So suppose he decides 
I'm not going to fire my gun. I'm not going to engage in violence against these people. I'll be here and pretend I'm doing this, but he's not going to do it. And if he can restrain Russians in any way, he will do that. And it's his private set of intentions once he's realized, but you know, he can't just quit because his family will be harmed or whatever. Now that person I think is not morally liable to be killed. He's not a threat to the Ukrainians. And if they could know that was his state, then it would be wrong for them to harm him or kill him. But of course they can't know that. Now, what about retaliation against innocent people in Russia? In general, that would be harming innocent people as a means of protecting other innocent people. And in general, that seems to me impermissible, but I'm not an absolutist about that. I do think that ordinary Russian citizens have right now a duty to do whatever they can to stop this war, or at least that some forms of protest that don't involve, you know, great personal risk, but whatever they can do without great personal risk to try to bring pressure to bear on the Russian government to stop this. I think that this is a duty that uh, all citizens in Russia have. And therefore, I do think that, for example, the harms that are imposed on Russian civilians by the imposition of economic sanctions don't count as terrorism. They are proportionate harms inflicted on these people because they are morally liable to some small harms in order to try to get them to do their duty to try to stop their government from prosecuting this war. There were protests initially, of course, as, as we know, in Russia, but they stopped pretty soon because, of course, the government suppressed them with violence and imprisonment. But those people were doing exactly what they ought to have done. And more people should be doing the same thing. If enough people did that, you know, there wouldn't be room in the prisons for them all. And the government would have to relent. But people are just caved in in Russia and there aren't protests anymore. They're going along with this, but killing children, no, no way. Children bear no responsibility for this. So my case might sound outlandish at first blush, but it's derived from a real case, which is, I think one of the wars that people generally agree was a totally just war was world war two and killing Nazis. And we know that the American forces bombed Dresden, killed 300,000 people in Dresden, including women, children, and babies. And we know that they um, dropped two nuclear bombs uh, on civilian populations in Japan. And those actions may have well led to the war ending quicker and may well have led many lives being saved. But as you say, if we describe the killing of uh, civilians in order to scare the other side into stopping as an act of terrorism, you know, it seems like we must make that label apply equally. And I wonder if you, you take that view. I do take that view. I think the uh, British bombings, primarily British bombings of Dresden and Hamburg were acts of terrorism, pure and simple. I think the American bombings of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were terrorism, pure and simple. I think these were the greatest acts of terrorism that I know of, exceeding anything that the people that we call terrorist ISIS and Al-Qaeda and others have been able to do. I mean, they far exceeding the destruction of the Twin Towers in, in, in New York, for example, which was, again, an odious act of, uh, of terrorism. And against a, a country that hadn't done anything comparable to what the Nazis and the Japanese had done in World War II. Important to, to, to mention that. In a way, I think it doesn't much matter to the retrospective evaluation of, for example, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, whether they were effective in causing the, it, 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 the, the Japanese to surrender. My sense is, in fact, though, that the historical evidence suggests that what really prompted the Japanese government to surrender were not the atomic bombings, but the entry of the Soviet Union into the Pacific War, which was, I think, announced on the same day as the bombing of Nagasaki. That's what did it. But even so, I, I do think here's the real problem. Some people say if the war had, uh, if we hadn't bombed those cities, the war would have continued 
and would have led to more civilian casualties in Japan as a side effect than were caused deliberately by those bombings. I still uh, think that probably the bombings would have been wrong, even if those claims were factually correct. And even if more American lives needed to be sacrificed, you just don't kill children in their homes to stop the war. So if we were to characterize your position in terms of ethical positions, it seems like you're definitely not just a straight laced utilitarian about this because the utilitarian is going to do the sums and he's going to say, well, if you drop the bomb and it results in a net, uh, saving of life, even though a whole lot of innocent people are killed, you do it. The deontologist is going to say, well, you can't step on skulls to save other skulls. You can't use people merely as a means. Are you then leaning towards a Kantian framework or a deontological framework? Yeah, I think there's very little Kantian about my, but they are definitely non-consequentialist and in some sense rather deontological. I, I do think one intends as a means makes a difference to the morality or the permissibility of one's action. I do think that there is a distinction between doing harm and allowing harm. I think that there's a stronger constraint against doing harm uh, than there is a, a duty to provide, to confer benefits on people that may be equivalent in magnitude to the harms that one might cause. So I think there's a kind of well-being, ill-being asymmetry. So these are all elements of deontological morality, and I think they all matter, but I also think consequences matter enormously. And so when I wrote about the morality of war, and in particular back in the 1980s, when I wrote a good bit about the um, morality of nuclear deterrence, people just naturally assumed that I was a consequentialist because I did write a lot about the importance of consequences in, in these matters. But m my views are deontological, but they are not absolutist. So there are some instances that are technically instances of terrorism that I think would be permissible just because the magnitude of the harm to be prevented would be so great in relation to the magnitude of the harm caused that the constraint could be overridden in those cases. So I'm not an absolutist. I think there can be permissible terrorism, but it's not it, 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 the difference between the magnitudes of the harms and so on has to be much greater than the consequentialist. It would have to be for the consequentialist to say the action was permissible. So one of the things that we've talked about is that there are really two things happening in parallel. The one is the moral rules that ought to be in place when we look at war, and the other one is the legal rules. And you said that the two might come apart. Do you think that we ought to make any changes to the law, given that you think that some of those laws, let's say, legitimate immoral behavior, or is it that having those laws in place uh, is for some kind of greater moral principle. My view can, I think, be fairly simply stated in quite general terms, and that is that at present, there has to be divergence between morality and the law because the law is designed to serve certain purposes, and it is designed to affect the deliberations of fallible and imperfect reasoners and imperfectly motivated human beings. So you need to provide deterrence and incentives to get people to behave in certain ways. And the laws that may best serve those purposes, the providing these deterrence and incentives may not map directly onto moral principles. I think they're going to diverge. And I think that's deeply regrettable and unfortunate. There's less necessity for this kind of divergence in, for example, domestic criminal law or in civil law, the law of torts. And that's because we have, over long periods of time, established background institutions that enable us to formulate laws that are more tightly congruent with moral principles. You know, if we were starting over in a Hobbesian uh, state of nature, a war of all against all, and were to 
create a, a body of domestic criminal law, it would probably be quite different from what we have now, simply because we wouldn't have the institutions in place that would enable us to adjust the law so finely to the requirements of morality. And the situation we're in internationally is something like a Hobbesian state of nature. It's not quite, we've, we do have international law, but we don't have institutions that enable us yet to bring the law more closely into congruence with morality. Um, what we need, I think, are institutions that provide epistemic guidance to people. So uh, right now, how do we know that a war is legal or illegal? Well, we you know, just go, go to the UN and the UN can say certain things relative to international law. That's not going to help people with the morality though. And particularly when you've got a security council in which many of the main violators of international law have a veto over what is declared by United Nations. So we don't have, for example, an impartial institution that would provide reliable epistemic guidance to soldiers about whether their war is just or unjust. They've just got their own leaders to listen to and the leaders of enemy states and maybe some spokesperson from the UN. But they're going to be inclined to believe their own leader rather than the leader of some enemy country. What we need is, like I say, it's an impartial institution that can pronounce on these matters that is reliable, that is staffed by international lawyers and moral philosophers and others who carefully study both just war theory, the law, and whose deliberations are well informed by the actual facts that are known through impartial institutions. So. If we could get these international institutions in place, then it would be more feasible to try to bring the law closer into conformity with morality. I want to return to something you were discussing earlier, uh, Russian civilians in Russia protesting. And you said it's right what they're doing. I'm curious whether you think they have an obligation to do so. And then a related question, which is, do you think Russians bear responsibility for what Russia is doing, regardless of whether they're combatants or not, and regardless of whether they're active combatants. So let's say they're actually in the fight or just wearing a uniform and haven't fought at all. So let's say I've been drafted as a Russian civilian to become a Russian soldier. I become a Russian soldier. I don the outfit. I haven't actually fired my weapon, but I'm in the country. I'm in Ukraine. And these things are happening. So there's bombings, there's shellings of cities. Do I bear any responsibility for that, even if I haven't fired my weapon? And the corollary, or not corollary, but the, the related question, is the Russian civilian in any way responsible as well, even if it's to a lesser extent? Responsibility for the harms that are being perpetrated or inflicted right now by Russian soldiers in Ukraine is a matter of degree. And I think it is diffused among a large number of people. The person who bears greatest responsibility by far is of course, Putin. And then a great deal of responsibility also lies with other officials in the Kremlin, with the highest ranking officers in the Russian military. These people are all deeply and highly complicit in what is being done. Uh, and as people get farther away from being able to influence what happens, their responsibility for what's going on diminishes. In the case of just ordinary Russian shopkeepers and so on, they bear some very small degree of responsibility by omission. I mean, maybe actively as well in live in, in still something, not quite a totalitarian state in the way that uh, the Soviet Union was totalitarian, particularly under Stalin, but they don't have a real democracy in, in, in Russia and their voices cannot be heard because of the control that the government exercises over the, the, the population. So I, I do think that ordinary civilians in Russia bear a very small degree of responsibility, mainly by omission. That is, they have some small degree of responsibility for what's being done in Ukraine if they don't protest what's being done. 
I think those people who are sufficiently courageous early on to protest, who were taken to jail, they don't bear any responsibility. They have done what they ought to have done. They can't be in any way criticized for what the Russians are doing because they have registered their opposition. They have tried to bring it to an end. Those who haven't bear some degree of responsibility. Those who were there wearing uniforms and carrying guns bear a very great degree of responsibility. Though someone who hasn't actively contributed yet may be complicit in a more minor way, but what is that person going to do in the future? I, I, I got this from a, a, a friend of mine who's a colonel in the American army who knows more about what's happening in Ukraine by far than I do. And what he said was, actually, there are Russian soldiers who are defecting, who are running away, hiding, who are surrendering or whatever. But th this isn't widely known because this Russia just has a kind of conveyor belt and just bringing more and more new soldiers in. And most of them do what they're told to do. And most of them participate in these atrocities and the bombings of civilian infrastructure of one sort or another. And so the presumption is that somebody who is in Ukraine, who's just got there, who's wearing a uniform and carrying a gun, the presumption is that this person is going to do like most of them do and participate in atrocities. The whole war, war is one great atrocity. And I, as I said early on, I think they're doing something terribly wrong, even when they're attacking only Ukrainian soldiers. But a lot of them are doing a lot more than that. And so I would think anybody who is there wearing a uniform, carrying a gun, who is likely to participate in combat in the future is very highly responsible for what's going on there, sufficient to make that person liable to be killed by Ukrainian soldiers. Do you think that the state of Ukraine is entitled to forcibly conscript people? I take it many people who want to exit the country and the view is that if you're a woman or a person under the age of 18, you are free to exit. If you're a man between the ages of 18 and 65, you're not free to exit and you're conscripted into the army and that you are then placed at risk of death. Do you think that generally conscription is uh, a morally permissible thing for states to do? I mean, it seems like, you know, if the Russians introduced conscription to get a bunch more young Russians killing Ukrainians, you might think the, the practice was abhorrent. So is it always a case by case basis? Is it a thing that's generally wrong that you can justify on the facts? Or is there some kind of thing we could say about it generally? This is something I haven't given sufficient thought to, so I'm answering off the cuff here. I think conscription is generally impermissible. And there are some instances in which I think um, voluntary enlistment is also impermissible. So for example, in Russia now, I think it's impermissible for any young person to enlist in the Russian military, they, they, you know, cause they, they're going to be subjecting themselves to indoctrination, conditioning, and they're very likely to be sent to engage in this horrible kind of wrongdoing, whether it's in Crimea, Georgia, Ukraine, wherever your case of Ukraine. One thing that did happen in Ukraine is that after the Russians invaded, quite a few young people stopped whatever they were doing and enlisted out of a sense of duty. You know, they thought, this is my homeland. This is where I live. This is where my friends are and my family. We have to protect. I have to help protect all of this. So there was a lot of that. And uh, again, that reinforces what I said about earlier about the wrongness of Russians killing Ukrainian military, these people wouldn't be in the military if it weren't for the Russians. That is the Russians make these people into soldiers. They, the Russians have made it the duty of some of these people to join the Ukrainian military. And I take it that a lot of these young men who uh, enlisted voluntarily were civilians yesterday. They're only in the Ukrainian military because the Russians made it their duty to cease being civilians. And that means that the Russians can't then kill them after they've made it their duty to cease to be civilians. So it's another argument for my claim about the immorality of Russians killing Ukrainian soldiers.
I do think that there probably is a justification for conscripting people into the military in Ukraine. On the other hand, I do think that there should be provisions for releasing from conscription a number of people who have sufficient reason not to be conscripted. In other words, if this was, if the, if, if the conditions are conditions of emergency. And so it's very difficult to implement the kind of procedures that would enable Ukraine to conscript only those people who really, in any case, to join the military and to excuse those people who have sufficient reason not to join in the military. But ideally, I think in a situation like this, some people have a duty to be in the army. And if they don't voluntarily fulfill that duty, conscription is appropriate. That's interesting because I think a lot of people today, perhaps differently from decades past, believe that although in certain situations like the Ukrainian situation, it would be supererogatory to join the army. It would be a very good thing to do. And you described earlier how brave it is to protect innocent lives and putting yourself in harm's way in doing so. But it also seems that it's not obligatory to do so, that you don't have to join the army. It'd be fantastic if you did. But I think a lot of people would balk at that intuition that it's obligatory. Yeah. Like I said, I, I haven't given sufficient thought to this to have strong views. So that may well be right. What's the duty of, say, for example, a, a, a fit, healthy 25 year old male shopkeeper in some Ukrainian citizen city right now, is it that person's duty to join the army, to try to protect people elsewhere in the country? You know, I honestly, uh, don't know. I, I think I can imagine particular cases in which I think it probably would be somebody's duty, somebody who's, for example, unemployed and likes adventure, <laughs> you know, or whatever, and very fit and strong and capable and, and so on. And I can imagine lots of other cases in which I think forcing somebody into the army would probably be wrong. But the problem is, as I was saying a moment ago, systems of conscription are such that it's very difficult for them to be highly selective and conscript only the people whom, of whom it can reasonably said that they really ought to be in the military and re uh, relieving those who have good excuses or good reasons for not being in the army from being conscripted. Systems of conscription just can't work that way, particularly in conditions of warfare. I, t I take your point that, that conscription isn't necessarily going to follow the obligatory supererogatory divide just because policy can't account for all the individual factors that morality has to account for. But I just want to push the morality point slightly further. Okay. Suppose that your position is that the 25 year old sort of full of energy, health, but nothing to do Ukrainian who's very fit and perhaps is a great shot that he's obliged to join the army, morally obliged. Is it then also the case that a 25 year old American is obligated to join the Ukrainian army. So the Ukrainians are accepting international recruitants and it seems the same situation, not in the sense that their daily living experiences are the same. I mean, maybe you want to say that, well, the Ukrainian, because he's present is more obligated, but that seems weird because it seems like he's a victim. So if anything, he should be let off. It, it should be the American 25 year olds that are even more obligated to join the effort, but that seems bizarre. And so I wonder whether if you take the moral obligation view, which I've pushed you into here, and I understand that it's not necessarily your firm position, but if one takes that view, it leads to some strange consequences. Well, I'm not sure that it does because of the phenomenon of special relations. So suppose my wife, my parent, my child is threatened by a wrongful attacker 
I have a strong, and, and suppose any kind of intervention to protect this person is very risky. I think I have a duty by virtue of my special relation to my wife, my parent, my child to accept that risk, but it may not be the case that some total stranger has a duty. Certainly my moral reason to intervene and risk my life is much stronger than that of a stranger. And I think that where the, the, the relation between a, a, a Ukrainian in one city and another Ukrainian in another city who don't know each other at all is nothing like the parent child relation or something like that. People still think it's a special relation of a sort. That is to say, the Ukrainians now uh, feel this heightened sense of national identity and solidarity precisely because they are being attacked as Ukrainians. And so I think because of that, their being um, fellow victims threatened, that binds them together, but also their Ukrainian nationality binds them together so that they are related to one another in a way that an, an American is not related to them. And for the same reason, though, to a much lesser degree, that I may have a duty to intervene to save somebody I'm closely, especially related to. So Ukrainians have a, a stronger moral reason amounting perhaps to a duty in many cases to join the military, to protect people that they are especially related to, though not nearly so closely as I'm related, for example, to my wife and children. But that makes a difference. On the other hand, I have thought about all these Americans with all their guns and everything who say, you know, I need to defend freedom. And they've got their arsenal all ready for when the government tells them to do something they don't want to do and they think it's a threat to their freedom. They're going to go out and they're going to take their guns and go out and defend themselves against the government and defend their rights and such. Yeah, I think it'd be a good idea for some of these people to put their money where their mouth is and get on over to Ukraine and use their guns to, to support freedom. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I've wondered where all these loudmouths are. Why aren't they over there now? You know, these blowhards like Trump and, you know, all the Trump supporters, why don't they get on over there and do something useful with their guns rather than just, you know, going off and killing school children with them. Well, a friend of mine interviewed such an American. His name's Texas Bentley, which strikes me as the most American name you could have. But he went to go and fight for the Russians in the Donbass region to, to liberate the poor Donbaskers from the evil Ukrainians. <laughs> so <laughs> this, the problem with sending out the, the crazy Americans, they're not fighting for the wrong side. <laughs> yeah, it's totally predictable, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you look at the way Trump just you know, licked Putin's boots, you know, because he thought, wow, this is the kind of guy he really admires. This guy just gets his way in everything. Did you see Trump's comments on the couple of days after the invasion? It was like, boy, Putin really knows how to swing a real estate deal. He just goes in and gets all this land for free. Uh